Mississippi in 1964 was a scary and violent place for African Americans and white outsiders who had traveled there in the summer as part of a large grassroots movement led by Bob Moses, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Annie Devine. The Council of Federated Organizations was a council made up of various civil rights organizations operating in Mississippi. Its goal was to distribute funds from the organization's voter education project in order to get black Mississippians mobilized in order to form the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in order to challenge what organizers believed was their largest hurdle, overcoming state government-dominated Dixiecrats. In 1948, a group of Southern white politicians led by Strom Thurmond promoted states' rights and racial segregation in the South. Nicknamed Dixiecrats in 1964, they believed that their states were being invaded by white college students up north, bent on challenging the Southern way of life. The Dixiecrats were strongest in states like Mississippi, especially in counties with the highest population of African Americans. In Mississippi and other places throughout the South, the Dixiecrats were in local, state, and national politics. They refused to even consider the idea of allowing African Americans a fair shake at voting, nonetheless actually allow blacks to participate in politics. In fact, Many Southerners who considered themselves Dixiecrats were also affiliated with outright racist organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan. As long as the Dixiecrats dominated politics in state, black Mississippians were certain they would not have a voice at the upcoming Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey later that summer. During the Freedom Summer Voter Registration Drive in 1964, COFO membership increased in great numbers in Mississippi. As their ranks grew larger, it was time for the next phase of Freedom Summer to begin. The ultimate goal of Freedom Summer was to mobilize an army of workers to register Mississippi's black population to vote. Once a suitable number was reached, the next step was to create a political party that represented black Mississippians. Called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, it was created to challenge the state's all-white primary system and send a black delegation to represent black Mississippians at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. Black Mississippians tried to participate in the state Democratic primary and delegation selection process. They were barred at every attempt to seek membership in the delegation process. The MFDP began to mobilize and hold its own delegation meetings throughout the state. If white Mississippians would not let them participate following the rules, they intended For most black Mississippians, these delegation meetings were their first experience with electoral politics. On August 6, 1964, nearly 3,000 people representing the MFDP attended a meeting organized by the MFDP's legal representative, Joseph Rao. Rao explained the entire delegation process and what to expect. Rao believed that the best tactic to gain a legitimate seat at the table of the National Convention was to send a delegation from the MFDP to the National Convention where it would meet with the Credentials Committee to argue that since blacks were completely excluded from the regular party and the fact that it gave its entire support for the national ticket, it should be seated at the convention with voting privileges. Bob Moses, the great architect of Freedom Summer, wanted the MFDP delegation that was to be sent to Atlantic City to be made up of the most radical members of the party. Sent to Atlantic City had to possess moral courage and insist that the MFDP be recognized and seated at the convention. The most prominent and outspoken of the MFDP delegates, Fannie Lou Hamer, was no stranger to struggle. Freedom Summer had lit a fire in Hamer, but it came at a cost. She was once beaten so badly she had to be hospitalized, or they also sterilized her without her consent, preventing her from ever having children of her own. By the time the MFDP delegation was headed to Atlantic City, Hammer was a veteran in the war for civil rights and she had no intention of backing down. MFDP met with a credential committee during a hearing on August 22nd. The MFDP needed to convince 11 of the 108 members of the committee in favor of seating the MFDP. If they were successful, the question would go to the convention floor where if eight states requested a roll call, each state's delegation would have to go on record as having voted for or against the MFDP. When the meeting began, Mississippi State Senator E.K. Collins of Laurel 
argue that the regular delegation be seated because of their past loyalties to the party. He also denied that blacks had difficulty voting in Mississippi. The white Mississippian delegation expected the MFDP to show up in Atlantic City. That's why, before they left for the National Convention, they chose to move the current state convention to be in recess and not officially adjourned. This meant that if it looked like Johnson was going to allow the MFDP a seat on the convention floor, the white delegation could excuse themselves from the National Convention without taking a vote. Thus, they could return to their state convention and declare their support for Goldwater. When it was the MFDP's turn to plead their case, Moses claimed that the MFDP had a right to be seated based on racial barriers currently excluding blacks from the electoral process. Witnesses were brought in, including Martin Luther King Jr., who told of police brutalities while jailed in Mississippi. But the most convincing testimony came from that of a mostly unknown sharecropper from Mississippi named Fannie Lou Hamer. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee, my name is Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, and I live at 626 East Lafayette Street, Roosevelt, Mississippi, Sunflower County, the home of Senator James O. Eastland and Senator Stinney. All of this is on account of we want to register to become first-class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Thank you. Hamer came across in a way that most Americans could empathize with. Her authentic and very tragic testimony reached the homes of millions of Americans. President Johnson tried to block Hamer's testimony by calling an impromptu press conference over nothing. Journalists quickly realized the president was afraid of the sharecropper and agreed to show Hamer's testimony again that evening uninterrupted. The MFDP had won run one. The next day, the meeting reconvened, and before a vote was taken, the president offered a last-ditch deal to make the MFDP honorary delegates, which came with no voting power. Hamer said no and added, We had not come there for no honorary status. We came here for voting status. After postponing a vote on seating the MFDP repeatedly, the president and his advisors had a compromise. The compromise said that two members of the MFDP delegation would be seated on the floor while the rest of the members would be considered honored guests. Only the regular Mississippi delegation would vote after they signed a loyalty agreement to the president. The compromise went on to include a promise that the National Party would eliminate racial discrimination in state delegations in all future conventions and would convene a committee before the 1968 convention to draw up guidelines for all states to follow. While Bob Moses and Hamer met with Hubert Humphrey to barter a compromise, the Credentials Committee presented the President's Compromise to the MFDP's lawyer. Urged by King to accept the compromise, the deal was made. This became a turning point for both the national political stage and for civil rights in Mississippi and other former slave states. On a national level, it forced many of the staunch racists in Congress to flee to the Republican Party, along with their voting bases in the South. Many of President Johnson's later actions will push more former Democrats to the Republican Party, changing the political landscape of the country. MFDP's campaign in Atlantic City renewed the voting rights campaign, not just in Mississippi, but also in places like Selma, Alabama. The MFDP expanded its influence into the Bible Belt throughout the entire South, which led to protests in Selma and a few months later, the Voting Rights Bill. President Johnson was not against what the MFDP's ultimate goal was. It was more struggle over his own desire to control the pace of change, even if he agreed with it. President Johnson's personality was as big as the state he came from, and if there was any pushing to be done, he wanted to be the one doing it. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it